Okay, so we will start with a quick review of the quiz paper, although time is very short given the remaining lecture. So I'll go fairly quickly over it. You can look at the solution and see if there are bugs or other ambiguities or problems. So the first question was about passing by reference and what happens if there is aliasing among the variables involved in a function argument. So main things that someone has implemented a reverse function which will work for any input and output arguments and so it passes in vec and also passes in vec as the output argument thinking that vec will be updated correctly in place to become the reverse of the original vec. But in the first case both of them have aliasing problems. The first implementation has in vec and out vec and reverse assumes that they are different vectors. But main does not satisfy that contract. Main actually passes references to vec the same vector as the two arguments okay. and that results in a bit of a problem. So what happens is in vec is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and in this case both in vec and out vec are references to the same vector. Okay. Now if you study the code or what the code is doing the first thing that happens is out vec is resized to in vec size and because out vec and in vec are the same that has no effect at all. Okay, it just preserves the original size of the array, not, not vector, nothing else changes. Now the mess starts, which is Vx equal to 0 to in vec dot size. So Vx is going across like this. Okay. Um, the implementation thing it thinks it is doing the right thing if in vec and out vec are different, which is out vec of Vn minus 1 minus Vx. So that is in the beginning Vn minus 1 minus Vx is assigned to in vec of Vx. But because it is the same array after the first iteration this becomes a 0 copied from there. After the second iteration this becomes a 1. After the third iteration this becomes a 2 it is copied from itself. And then what happens I keep going and this 1 is now copied from there to remain 1, this 0 is actually cancelled out and copied from here to become a 0. So that is what will happen because of running the first implementation of reverse, it is not actually reversing anything. Okay. Now how about the second attempt that is also bug, yes. Hmm. What is that constant doing? Yes, but what the compiler is going to look at is whether you are trying to modify in vec or not. As far as the compiler is concerned it does not know how this function will be called. As long as you are syntactically not trying to change in vec in the body of the function the compiler is fine. Okay. So that is the first implementation which would work if in vec and out vec were different but will fail if they are the same. Similarly the second implementation does the following. It assumes that out vec is empty to start with. Okay. That may or may not be a good assumption while you are writing your code. So now in vec is again 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and out vec is alias to the same. Okay. So out vec is actually not empty when it comes in which is itself a bug or you know misunderstanding between the caller and the callee. And then what does this implementation do? It looks at the incoming vector from the last position downward and appends it to the outgoing vector. Okay. So what is going to happen is that I will look at the 4 and I will append the 4 to the same array actually, they are the same. Okay. And then I will look at 3, I will append 3 to 1, 0. So your final state of both in vec and out vec which are the same vec will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay. So none of the two implementations actually correctly implement vector reversing under the special condition that the same vec is passed as the two arguments. Okay. So what would be a safe implementation that you actually use a temporary and then do something with it. Right. 
if you reset, if you resize the outvec to zero, then the invec will be lost, and both of them would be empty, which is also a bug. So if you want your function, library functions to work, irrespective of what assumptions scholars make, you have to code it in a very gen general way. All right, so that's question one. Um, the only thing you required there is to understand the meaning of ampersand and that aliasing is happening. Those are the two things we tested. So aliasing we already discussed in class, so I was hoping that several people would get this. The second question is mathematically cute. Uh, there's not much programming to do there, but it's nice. So, so far we talked about binary encodings where you look at a decimal number and you just transcribe it to a different radix, base two, and that's how it's stored in the computer. But there's no inherent reason why the computer has to actually store, you know, assign a decimal number to its corresponding binary number. All we need is a bunch of bit patterns. As long as we can distinguish between two numbers and do arithmetic on them correctly, who cares? So in particular, if you thought about how binary codes work, it's very clear that it has a simple recursive structure. So the zero bit binary code, see with p bits, the number of code words you get is two to the power p. Okay. So with zero bits, p equal to zero, you get one code word which has zero bits. So you can think of it as an empty sequence. Sequence. Okay. Now with p equal to one, etc., you get two code words, two to the power one. So one is zero and the other is one. I'll drop the brackets from now on. Okay. Now what do you do for p equal to two? You say, well, the first bit can be zero or one for each of those first bit there can be two second bits, and that's how I get my four code words. So extending that one more step, what happens with three bit codes? So again, all I need to do is to stick out zero and one like that, and then copy those, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, and again another copy. And then I fill in the ones. Those are three bit code words. Right? So instead of doing it this way, in case of the gray code, so this is B3, the gray code G3, for example, says I'm again going to produce the first half of code words with zero prefixes, the second half of code words with zero suffix, uh, one prefixes. Okay. But whatever be the ordering of two bit code words here, the ordering here will be reversed, it's reflected. Okay. So in particular, for the p equal to one case, it's the same. Okay. Here, what will happen for the gray codes is 0, 0, 1, 1, but 0, 1, 1, 0. So this code word is reflected okay, here. So similarly, if I take those code words, and write out 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. I have to reflect it. So I say 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. And gray codes have this beautiful property that as you go from one code word to the next, exactly one bit changes. In fact, even when you roll back from the last one to the first one, which is not the case with standard binary code, because as you can see, from 0, 0,11 1, 1 to 1,0,0, 0, 0, all three bits change. Okay, from 1,1,1 1, 1, 1 to 0,0,0, 0, 0, 0, again, all three bits change. So there are many transitions where multiple bits are changing. So why are gray codes so useful? So for example, you have this robot arm, and there's a motor with a shaft which is positioned at some place, right? The computer needs to read where the arm is to decide how to move it. Okay. So because this is the property of one bit change even holds as you circle around, you could think of gray codes on a circle. If you have three bits, okay, you could think of it as a disk with eight sectors, right? And the three bits are like that, okay? So let's say zero, 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 and then the second code is zero, zero, one, 
0 1 1 0 1 0 and so on okay. The benefit of this is what happens is the motor shaft is connected to a disc like this and then there are optical or mechanical sensors which are reading either they are metal foils connected to ground or they are dark and light patches on a disc. In either case uh, optical or mechanical sensor is reading those three bits to decide at what angle the disc is therefore at what angle the arm is. So what happens is as the disc spins past at the junction between two different sectors if multiple bits change mechanically or you know optically they will never really change at the same time. So at the transition point the sensor may get a weird reading of some other angle position and that might throw off the controller thinking oh the arm has suddenly moved to some weird angle. Whereas in grey course that will never happen because exactly one bit will change position. You don't want multiple bits to change as you cross sectors because the multiple bits will not change exactly at the same instant at least as sensed by the computer. Okay. Some bits will change faster than others because of the electronics limitations of electronics limitations of sensing the light or the switch position and therefore so for example in the binary code suppose you are making a transition from this to this and this bit changes first. So the first code word you get is 111 which is suddenly a jump to that position. Okay, so there is a transient electrical phenomena which gives you a weird code that can never happen in this because only one bit changes at a time. So that is why grey codes are very useful for analog to digital conversions and sensing positions of arms and motors and so on. Okay. So anyway the question was more about you know how to calculate grey codes. So to give you the second answer first uh, that is actually a quite a giveaway clue. So if I take the binary code and shift it right by 1 I am going to get this I am going to get zeros for the first two guys 1 for the next 2 and then 2 for the next 2 and 3 for the last if I shift it one position to the right. So this is n this is n divided by 2 assuming unsigned okay. and now if you stare at this it is very clear that this is the XOR of those two that is the XOR of those two so it is all XOR. Okay. So in fact grey code is equal to n XOR n divided by 2 or n shift right by 1 for unsigned those are identical yes in order to convert that g into a binary form you know if you did that is fine yeah. so so remember that n is already provided to you in binary format in the standard you know radix 2 number format this is also a binary number if you want you can write it out in bits huh Sorry, n is an n is an integer, yes, unsigned integer. You need unsigned so that the shifting, and so is g. Yeah. If it's if it's functionally the equivalent function, you'll get full marks. That's all. You don't need to recognize it as an XOR as long as your logic is correct. That's fine. So now the real question is the first one, which is suppose you didn't know this trick, how do you complete the recursive routine for finding the gray code given an n? Okay, without doing bit arithmetic. So the recursive function does not do bit arithmetic. It's just an exercise in recognizing recursion when you see it. And here's the logic. So if you stare at the table, it should be relatively clear if you are relaxed and caffeinated sufficiently. So, so what's the deal, right? I, I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to point you to a particular row. The function of n is to point you to a particular row, and then I have to find the columns in the G matrix. So if I haven't pre-calculated G and stored it, which is the, you know, that's not the point. 
So n is either in the first half or n is in the second half. And that's very clear from the sample codes that are given. So remember there are total of 2 to the power p minus 1 plus 2 to the power p minus 1 for a total of 2 to the power p rows. And if n is in the first half, then the first bit is 0. If n is in the second half, the first bit is 1. And that's basically the clear initial logic of the recursive routine. So first of all, if p is equal to 0, then there's nothing to push. It's an empty sequence. So yes, return. The first blank is just return. If n is less than 2 to the power p minus 1, so 0 through 2 to the power p minus 1 minus 1, then we push back a 0. Otherwise, we push back a 1, or true, false and true. Okay. And then the recursion is what's the interesting part. So the important thing is that if n is here, then push back 0. Here you push back 1. But the important thing is that going in, I don't reflect. And here I have to reflect. Okay. Now, this is not entirely correct. The first time around, this is correct. But when I enter the recursion, I have to use the reflect sum. Okay. So anything you are doing here, you are supposed to insert the opposite thing there. Okay. So in fact, you have to push back one of the 12 check. Reflect and not reflect. Which order does it come? So in one case, you push back reflect. In the other case, you push back not reflect. Okay. And then the rest is fairly clear. There's only one more thing left to explain, which is in case n is going in there, then as I have already decided this, and I'm diving into this smaller table, I have to subtract 2 to the power p minus 1 from n. Okay. Now it turns out that if you, you can solve the second part in two ways. Either is to, one is to just eyeball it and recognize that XOR is going on. The other is to actually translate this logic into the shift and the XOR. Okay. Right, so subtracting 2 to the power p minus 1 from n has a correspondence to shifting the original number. Yeah. So if you were to implement uh, instead of reflect, where hmm. you reflect there, if I were to implement that part, that code over there, and effectively that's what's happening. If you decided to change the recursive code so that you would still do it correctly, you'll get full marks. Sir, if I were to implement that, then hmm. it's hmm. it's, uh, whether false and true, also that will decide. Yeah, but see, this is you don't even need recursion here. Where's the recursion here? You only shift right n once, and that you're done, right? Whereas this is a sillier way of doing it. So I did it yeah. similar way that, but I mm. did it big way. So it gave mm. me zero and one output. Mm. Give me zero and one. Yeah. So if I were to implement that code, our our final policy is if it works, you get full marks. We don't really care how. In fact, even if you take this code and mess it up a little bit so that your answer is correct, we'll give you full marks. So the only thing we're looking for is a recursive structure. Which is correct. That's all. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. That's a good point. Uh, you can you can check it out. So see if you can find a bug. That's actually a good point. It may be not reflect, just like the upper one. Okay. Um, So if you find this wrong, post it on Moodle, find, find the correct solution. Okay. This is not final yet, we are still fooling around. So the third question was not supposed to be difficult, uh, but the language was probably not too well constructed for you. So there are these three courses and there are four hours to prepare for it. Hours can only be partitioned integrally between the courses. So English, French, and German, you can allocate each of them anything between zero and four hours. Total hours is four. Okay. 
And here's a table of, if you study that subject for so many hours, what's the probability of failing it? So if you don't study at all, you'll fail English with a probability of 0.8. But if you study English for four hours, you'll only fail with a probability of 0.6. Now the first thing that's immediately clear from the table is in this particular example, that the probability of passing increases as you study. Okay. This is not always true in real life, but at least here it's monotonically in, uh, decreasing. The failure probability is decreasing. So clearly you want to use up all your four hours studying and not doing something else. But the question is how to allocate. And it's not obvious. So corresponding to this P table, which is the probability of failure table, we put up a dynamic programming table, which is called F. So FXT is the best or minimum probability of failing courses number T and to the right, larger if you have X hours remaining or available for those courses. So the small trickery here to see if you have understood dynamic programming is that the solution is no longer built up from the zero side to the larger side. It's actually the opposite in one dimension. Okay. So here is T, it's courses 0, 1, 2. Here is X, the hours, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, in this particular example. If you actually use symbols and say if the input, input array is m by n, this, this is this, that's fine. Okay, you'll get full marks for that. But the important thing is that as you have defined f, so f at any xt, if you have two hours left to allocate to courses one and beyond, then what's the minimum probability of failing both of them? Okay. And therefore, it's kind of, we start from this and then you work our way left. Okay. So if I had, so if I only care about course two in the world and I have zero hours to study, then it's clear what my failure probability is. That's already given by P. Okay. Yeah. So, so clearly, so as I've argued that there's no point wasting time. You want to use up all of it because the more you study, the lower your failure probability is becoming. So if, if the only course in the world were course two and you had two hours, you would spend the two hours in course two because hey, your probability of passing in course two is going up. But from this column onwards, things become non-trivial and the quantity you're finally interested in this quantity. If I have four hours, and I allocate it nicely, what's the minimum probability of passing at least one of them? So I want to minimize the probability of failing all of them. F is failing courses at T or to the right and to the right, given I have X hours allocated for the courses to the right of me. Oh, just code. You don't have to find anything actually. Hmm. Huh. So I'll, I'll show from. So, so one thing you need is the expression for filling up the intermediate cells here, right? So what the way you're going to do this is you're going to range k between zero and four. Okay, so positioned at t, which is to the left of two. Okay, at some column t. I'm going to say I'm going to allocate k hours to the tth course, and then anything that remains to t plus one onwards. Okay, it's written right there. So remember, f is the probability of failing everything at t and to the right. I want to minimize it. Okay. So I fail to graduate if I fail all three courses. So I work up the solution from the right to the left. Okay. So fxt gives me the best or smallest probability of failing everything, all courses at t and to the right of it. So at the course t, I can allocate anything, suppose I have x hours in hand. Okay. So let's say this is in particular my x and this is the specific t I am at. And I'm asking if I had three hours in hand, and I have to only take care of courses one and two. 
then how am I going to best allocate time so that the probability of passing, failing both of them is minimized. I only have to pass one of them, remember. Okay. So the way I do that is since I have three hours in hand, k, this number k can range between 0 and 3. And I'll allocate anything between 0 and 3 hours to course 1 itself. And the remaining time x minus k to course 2 and beyond. There's nothing beyond, but. T equal to 2, the probability of failing is just the p's. There's nothing left. So now this formula is fairly clear. Uh, the best or minimum probability of failing everything at t and beyond, given x hours, that's fxt, okay, is, so you have all these options of spending k hours on course t. Over all those options, you want to minimize the probability of failing the tth course with k hours times the best probability of failing the t first, first course onward to the end given x minus k hours. So we discussed something very, very similar to this, subset sum, right? So if I have to make up a sum of a, if I use a n, then a n is subtracted from a and the remaining guys have to make up a total of a minus a n, very similar. It just goes in the opposite index order, but that's a very minor difference. You can even quote this the other way if you want. CV is F40. So this is the final cell of interest to you. If I had four hours, how do I minimize the probability of failing all the all the courses? So it's a slight departure in that you know the examples we had always had the answer in the lower right corner. This one has the example that way, and your computation will proceed in a wave front to the left. It's not a step. You just fill in all the, you can fill the column in any order, it doesn't matter. But you have to fill the columns one by one, starting from the right and coming to the left. So the recurrence is the trickiest part. You invest something in the current column, you keep the rest for the right, multiply the two probabilities because failure probabilities are independent. And once you get the recurrence, the C++ code is very, very trivial. Uh, we'll decide depending on the class performance, if you got the logic of the recurrence wrong but you implemented the C++ code right, we might give you most of the marks for the C++ implementation only. Okay. So you might not hold the mistake in the earlier part against you in the later part. Probably you shouldn't. Okay, so that's the exam, but does, yeah. So the name of K was already given in the question, but third part. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, if you, if you chose it an implicit, fine. I don't know. I mean, you know, we're just trying to give away one of the three marks. Or yeah. So D is just turning that recurrence into a code, and that's pretty easy. Fill up the last column, then uh, fill up the. So by the way, if you do the calculation, this is the final matrix you see. Your probability of failing all three courses, given four hours, is about 0.29 that bold first entry. Okay. So that's the F matrix you get eventually. And the code to create that F matrix is just a few lines actually. There's nothing particularly interesting. After the declaration, it's all very simple. So what do we have here? Um, so the failed probabilities are given in that P and you read that from CN. And then the matrix F has the same size as the failed probabilities. Then you initialize the last column, which is X comma size 2 minus 1 for x between 0 and size 1. And then the recursion loop um, goes down the x's, but it goes to the left on the t's. So t is from size 2 minus 2. This is size 2 minus 1. So from size 2 minus 2 downward, minus minus t, you have to create a best variable to get the minimum which is initially max double or plus infinity or whatever. And then you calculate for each k between 0 and x inclusive. Um, okay. And then you assign f to the best value. And that's it. So the code is pretty simple. If you made a small mistake in the recurrence and you transcribe that into the code, we won't cut marks for the code. So when this is dynamic programming style, what does Dynamic programming is a historical name which says that instead of recomputing recursive values of a function again and again like in Fibonacci 
or in string edit distance calculation, make up a matrix where the elements will give you values of the recursive function. So, so like, uh, like in a tree. In a? Like a mapping in a tree. A mapping in a tree, where did that come from? Like when you start branching off. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like if a computation is happening again in some other branch. Yes. The value from a table. So, so that would mean you recording all the values. That's correct. So, so in some cases they do, in some cases they don't. For string edit distance of Fibonacci they don't. For this problem it doesn't. It's equal to the size of the input which you have to store anywhere. But yes, there could be recursive programs that you cannot easily turn into a dynamic program. There are such things. So here only we need to store the minimum of those. That's right. Yeah. That's fine. So, next uh, we come to this event simulation. Now, today I do not want to go into the intricacies of the event simulation logic that we will find in the code I have already posted. Today we will study the more software engineering aspects of it, uh, how we are coding it up, not so much how it works. So, uh, the broad logic without looking at the code in detail is that we have this two main structures. One is the actual queue where customers are queued up and what do we really put in this? I mean a very natural choice for a data structure for the queue is a list because as you have seen you can add things to the end of the list, you can pull out things from the front of the list all in constant time. Okay. So we want a list of something and call it a queue, list of what? So it could be one of the primitive types like integer double, we do not know. It is actually much better, so as a side comment, much of the intellectual content of this course has already been imported to you. You know how to deal with indices, you know how to sort, you know how to search, you know how to hopefully do a little bit of dynamic programming. So about 80 percent, 90 percent of that is over. The important things that will cover in the remaining part of the course is not so much the art of algorithms as such, but how do you keep your cool and actually get through thousands to tens of thousand lines of code by good programming practices. Okay. What does C++ give you to structure your thoughts better, to keep related data in similarly named things, okay. uh, how to divide up units of computation naturally into methods and functions that you have seen a little bit of already. Okay. Life got a lot better if you could write functions. Okay. And we will continue on that. And so much of the remaining two weeks, half of it at least, we are going to spend on how to structure your code so that it reads easier, you can write it more quickly and cleanly. Okay. So instead of saying that a customer is an integer and then having five different arrays storing the name of the customer and you know when they landed up, when they left, we are going to have something called a record or a structure or a struct. Okay. So customer will be such a new type that we will create and we will see how to do that. So. So our queue is a list of customers. The customer in the front of the queue, uh, it's slightly grayed out. That's the customer who is being served at any time. If there is a customer there, the customer is being served. Now this structure or the struct for each customer, we want to hold a few things. In real life, you might even hold the customer's name and date of birth, who knows. But you know, in a bank, for example, the customer gets a ticket number. Now the ticket number is perhaps local to that day's transactions. Okay, every day there is a new ticket roll coming out of the ticket machine. But once the teller gets the customer's customer number, okay, then a lot of other fields about the customer can be extracted from the bank's computers. Okay. So maybe this customer structure does not hold the customer's entire life history. But for the purpose of the queuing management, you at least want to hold the ticket number. Okay, so ticket number is there. Okay. Now what is the ticket number? It's probably an int. Int is fine. You probably don't expect to serve two billion customers in a day. Okay. So it's perfectly fine to use it. Use a uh, integer. And then you want to record this arrival time, start service time, and end service time. That gives you the customer's experience in the system. Okay. Um, well, again, as far as the simulation is concerned, whether there's loud music playing or whether it's too stuffy, we, we can't model that so far. So these may be doubles, arrival time, start service time and end service time. Now we could of course declare three 
lists. One of a ticket number, one for arrival time, one of service time, one for you know, end service time. But that's cumbersome. They logically belong in one record. And if I define three different lists doing that, then my pushback and pop front operations would have to be done thrice over for every customer. It looks cumbersome. You comment, you forget about one statement, the whole logic fails. So it's all very dangerous and it's ugly. Okay. So that's why we create structs in C++. And then we need that event queue, which I won't be dealing with much today anymore. That's the mapping from a time to an action. But again here, um, you might have said that the time is a double and an action is a suitably coded, uh, coded integer. Huh? Or an enum. Okay. But it's better to write it using a word which the program reader will instantly understand. So when you say multi-map time action events, that is much more meaningful than if you say multi-map double int events. Okay. So because someone reading the code will instantly understand that this multi-map is keyed on time. And what it accesses is some kind of an action. Let's now go look at what action is and what time is. Fine. So that's how uh, we'll start out on this uh, next study of types, structures, and then classes.